Welcome to Next Radio with Broadcast Bionics, innovative solutions for creative people. Hello. Um, yes, I run the Guardian's audio department. I'm also a feature maker. I run the Hackney podcast in my spare time. And I'm also creating an audio app at the moment, which is in prototype at the moment, which triggers off sounds depending on your location. And um, we're looking for volunteers to try it out at the moment. So let me know if you want to try it out. Um, I moved away from standard radio five years ago from the BBC. And I've been pretty evangelical about um, online radio, online audio since then. Um, but I have been told uh, to speak specifically about on-demand audio today. So um, there's plenty of uh, streamed online audio out there, but this is just on-demand audio. So five reasons uh, why on-demand audio is better than radio. Number one. Uh, and this is really my main point. People have chosen to listen to you. Um, radio is seen as a passive art form. Uh, the majority of time, you listen to it while you're doing something else. And the way that we make programs, the grammar that we use, um, compensates for this. So how many times have you heard a cue into a package that pretty much tells you what's going to be in that package? You hear the package, and then the back announcement tells you that again. Um, On-demand audio doesn't need to be like that. Um, you don't need... To, uh, to tell people what your program's about beforehand. And um, Benjamin Walker makes a program called Too Much Information in the States, and he is really a prime example of this. He did a, a three-part series uh, during, the, um, during the midterms, and it was an hour-long program, the first one, and it started like this. The other night, I am... Um in my car on the way home from grocery shopping, and I get this text. That, actually, it's a sext from this Republican chick that I hook up with sometimes. You hook up with Republicans? Yeah. If you work on the Hill long enough, it's going to happen. So um, Ben is uh, a very liberal American, and he's got a following who know that, and he takes a very kind of sidewards look at politics and ideas. He doesn't need to tell people who he is at the top of his show. It's pretty obvious what this series is going to be about. Um, often just the metadata on your on-demand on audio tells you that. So if we're making a Guardian program that is the Books podcast from the Edinburgh International Books Festival with Ian Rankin, really the metadata tells you that. You don't need a 30-second menu telling you the same thing. But what does this mean for program makers? Um, well, I think this means you can be more ambitious and more creative. You can take more risks, uh, which leads me to point number two. Um, you need to be brave. There are 260,000 active podcasts at the moment in the iTunes store, which add up to over 6.5 million episodes. So really you need not to sound like a regular radio program. Um, so it could be a catchy start to a program like this one from Love and Radio in the States. <laughs> I very, very rarely shave my legs. But when I went to this shoot, it was one of the first times ever that I shaved my legs. It's like a Japanese tea ceremony, you know? You get all your ingredients, you get the soap and the water. I'm standing in the shower. I put my leg up on the faucet, and I, like, soap my legs up. And I'm thinking of it in a commercial, you know? I'm, like, trying to do it all sexy. I'm like, ooh. Or it could be that you have nine and a half minutes of sound of a underground boiler room in South London, like Touch Radio have done. At The Guardian, it's a very useful place to experiment as well. We can try out talent without having to commit to whole series. We can try new treatments out an experiment, and comedy in particular, has found um, on-demand audio a really useful place for this. Um, Answer Me This have had particular success. I had a very out-of-character thought this morning. That's very unlike you. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting my breakfast ready, uh, and I thought, ooh, I could have a glass of wine. <laughs> and as listeners of the podcast will know, 
I don't even really drink ever. Yeah, that would be your once a decade glass of wine if you were to have it. But it makes me a bit worried about this month that we're about to have off doing the podcast. Yeah, you know, that's what I'm... you do on a business day. What are you going to do when you're in holiday mode? <laughs> if I'm just drifting around doing nothing without this to tie me down to a regular schedule, <laughs> come back in a month, I could be a mess. I had beer for breakfast once. Where? Oh, just in, in the flat when I was a student. My next point is a, a, a short one, but... Um, it's in stereo. Now, we know where the speaker's going to be. They're usually on people's ears. Most people are listening on headphones. So it means that we can play with binaural, we can play with panning in a way that we really can't do with radio, when most people are probably listening on a, on a mono radio in their kitchen. Number four. It can be treasurable. Now, film and music have been brought bought, listened to, and watched over and over again. They're collected, they're shared between friends and fans, and I think that speech radio should be too. Some of the radio pieces that we are making take enormous amounts of resources, time, and money. We build them on ster several stereo tracks, we carefully craft them, and I think we should embrace the fact that we can now make pieces specifically for download. It is actually worth the effort making them beautifully, and we should encourage our listeners to collect them and treasure them like they do DVD collections. Groups like In the Dark are emerging to celebrate radio as an art form. Kind of film club for radio fans. They collect, they spend their evenings listening to radio features. And on-demand audio can be part of this movement, helping to nurture the appreciation of this art form. And as radio and audio become, become treasured even more, so will the idea that these pieces should be listened to on multiple times. So programmes should work on the first listen, but if you listen on multiple occasions, new layers and new complexities can be revealed. And in addition to people treasuring and listening to our pieces many times, there is the simple fact that you can discover them over a longer period, the kind of much, much talked about long tail of programmes. So my final point is that the space for downloadable audio is really a space for innovation. If you take my previous points that we can discover content over a much longer period, pieces may be listened to over and over again, that technical subtleties may be more apparent, and that we have our listeners' attention, I propose that downloadable audio means that we can actually change what we're making. We can think of our pieces as writers think of novels, we can make albums rather than strands, and we can have fan clubs around our programmes. Now, radio will always be more niche than telly and film, but with the downloadable platform, if we believe in what we're making, I think we can grow real communities around our work.